Radio. Our mistakes, our flaws, our imperfections make us awesome. So a great performance is you screw up, but you bounce back from that is a phenomenal performance. Way better than perfect. Perfect, like I said earlier, was boring. Hey y'all, I'm Ryan Devlin and welcome to this month's Struggle Climbing Show Coach Conversation where I connect with elite climbing coaches to talk through where my training's at, cover listener questions, and dive into training topics that I think are going to help you out as you navigate your own training and climbing goals. Now today we're practicing the martial arts of rock with the climbing sensei himself, Justin Zhang. Now, I was first introduced to Justin by past guest James Lucas, who said that Justin is one of the most experienced and thoughtful coaches around. And I got to tell you, after chatting with Justin for today's show here, I totally agree with James's assessment. This one went to a bunch of really interesting places. Now, Justin brings over two decades of coaching experience to the climbing community, drawing from his impressive accomplishments on El Cap. We talk a little bit about that at the beginning of the show here. And also the cutting edge sport routes that he's done in the Sierra foothills and now where he climbs in the front range of Colorado. Justin's well known for his expertise in supporting climbers with managing their fears and their mental barriers, anxieties. And as you're going to hear today, he goes beyond conventional coaching, you know, just like creating workout routines and that kind of thing to really nurture a holistic approach to climbing development. Today we explore the two types of climbers that Justin says he most often sees, the engineer and the artist, and a few tools that he finds are helpful depending on which camp you lean into of those two. We explore breath as our engine, the secret power of being in sync with your belayer, identifying technical versus mental strengths and weaknesses, why perfection is not the goal, I really found that one pretty enlightening, what our bodies do on the wall when fear creeps in, and also just a few little tricks that can help us to try hard and perform at 100% when we need it. This episode is supported by Rungni, which of course is Magnus Mitbo's brand that you all know about. They make rad clothing and high performance chalk all at great prices. And I gotta say you guys, after using Magdus chalk and climbing in Rungni pants for a long while now, The quality is off the charts. Their pants and their shorts are stretchy, they're durable, and they are super comfy, whether I'm struggling at the gym or a full day out at the crag. And then I'm also loving their chalk bucket. When I'm bouldering, it's got this magnetic closure, which is so cool and satisfying to use. It doesn't spill, and they're just using premium materials in all that they're doing over there. Lastly, their Magdust Chalk won't break the bank, and you can pick up a bundle that'll keep your hands dry and pulling hard for a whole year. It's been treating me really well out of my project. I can't say enough about it. It's a great company. And check this out. You can now score 15% off everything over at Rungni. Bags, buckets, apparel, chalk, all of that, and support the struggle while you're doing it. Just hit that link in your notes or pop by thestruggleclimbingshow.com slash Rungni, R-U-N-G-N-E, and you will get that discount. And hey, just one quick little request for y'all before we dive into the episode here. If you are listening right now, but you haven't yet subscribed or followed the show, could you just take a quick second and hit that little plus button there in your player? That will ensure that you're going to get every episode as it drops. And let me tell you, you got some big, big, big names coming your way this month, so you don't want to miss them. And then it also helps me to grow the show, keeps my sponsors psyched, and it helps me to keep cranking out more content for you all here at the Struggle Climbing Show. So thank you for following and supporting and maybe even sharing the show with your friends. Okay, that's enough of that. Let's tighten up our black belts and get into it with the climbing sensei, Justin Jean. I'd love to hear a little bit about your journey as a climber, and then we can kind of dovetail that into how it it has informed your coaching. So early on, I mean, in the early 90s, I started right out of high school. I grew up in a town just outside of Index, Washington, mm-hmm. the land of the sandbagging. And I learned to climb there, which is a phenomenal place to learn to climb features and be a technician. And I wasn't I wouldn't say I was gifted. I learned on my own. I met some friends. They kind of kept me alive, but had a number of mentors through the years. My wife and I, I needed to get out of the Northwest with all the rain. 
My wife and I moved to Colorado in 98. By that time, I was obsessed with climbing. I just couldn't get enough of it. I started off more of a trad climber. I remember when I first started, there was a cover with the Hoobers freeing the Salve. And that really ignited kind of like a dream of mine, which I wanted to free the Salve back then. I think I was like climbing 511 Sport, 511 Trad. Fully loved it. Um, yeah. And then in like 98, I started to try to hack away of giving the Salve a free attempt in the early days, fully failed. But finally, pieced it together and take that off. So Sick. I've done four free routes on El Cap. I more or less identify more of a trad climber than a sport climber, but I love sport climbing. If I sport or, or if I trad or, climb too much, I end up just being kind of wimpy. So I have to learn how to sport climb to try hard. What was right. your question? Yeah, yeah. Well, I got to stop you there because I mean, four free routes on El Cap is not common. I mean, that is that is like a hell of an accomplishment, but I feel like people maybe don't understand as much how impressive and challenging and technically what the technical requirements are of, of climbing El Cap uh, and then to free it. It's really impressive. I'm assuming you spent a lot of time in the Valley in, in order to do that. And that's probably informed your love for movement and, and technicality, as I recently had a conversation with uh, Carlo Traversi as well. And just the style of climbing on that granite in Yosemite, especially El Cap, the grades almost don't equate to grades anywhere else, it doesn't seem like. Yeah, and this experience, some hard lessons that I learned on El Cap was you spend days up there and you barely walk around. And the ability to walk around, unweight your waist, and just kind of move is limited. And then you just don't eat ideal food. You wake up and you wake up for ideal conditions. So it's right. rough. But I love the thing that attracted me to El Cap was you had to bring your game face and you had to bring your A game to get the job done under the pressure. It's never ideal conditions. You're never like, oh, I feel good. Your body aches, your skin's trashed. You're doing vertical lug luggage hauling. There's all these uh, issues that arise. And then the one unique thing is I've always done a uh, team free sense of mine. So me and my partner both freed the route at the same time. And that adds another element of... Yeah stress because you want to be supportive for your partner, but where they're struggling, you might not be struggling or vice versa. Right. And it really creates a team dynamic of being patient and being supportive with the other person. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. Perhaps that was the earliest the start of of part of your coaching and maybe a focus on the mental side and and the technical side, as you mentioned, that's that's an area where you've developed a, a reputation and expertise and a passion. And to be up on the side of a couple thousand feet of granite where maybe you first or second go a pitch and your partner's really struggling, you know, working through that is, is that part, do you think, do you think that kind of laid some foundation or some seeds for, for what was to come? I would say in some levels, but more so personally, because I struggle with anxiety and fear and it's really challenging to be in a good headspace up there in that environment yeah. where you truly want to get the job done. You're very passionate and committed and that gets in your head. It took me years to realize, yes, you can always repeat a pitch. So if you fall, your first go isn't always your best go and just sort of be kind and patient for yourself, how to be drop into the zone or the present state on the wall was always really hard. Yeah, it did and influenced my coaching style for sure. I mean, you're doing this on on El Cap like it's 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 interesting to me to hear that you're working through fears and anxieties while on you know, one of the kind of scariest situations that a climber can put themselves into, which is, you know, big wall ascents where you're spending multiple days and the exposure is huge and there's weather and 
uh, probably in the back of your mind, you're thinking about rock fall and any number of, you know, all these variables that, that happen on big walls. So it was, it, it wasn't natural for you. It wasn't, it didn't seem like it was the easiest path. So what drew you to the big walls there? The fact that what you just said, it wasn't the easiest path. Uh, it was something that back then there wasn't a lot of inf information on how to strategize and tackle those larger walls in a free manner, how to like where to haul, where to stash your camps, kind of stage and blast up, blast down, move, reestablish. It was just the problem solving. I just really love the problem solving of piecing it together. I mean, we talk about memorizing all the moves of a sport climb. At those times, I could nearly memorize all the moves from the base to the top of my projects. And that's really cool to fall asleep doing is just rehearsing the moves. Yeah. And see how far you can get. Well, I know that feeling well. And, and while I, I, I can't empathize or, or exactly relate to big walls in Yosemite, I, I have done, you know, a, a bunch of multi-pitch out West and, and in Red Rocks and that kind of thing. But, you know, my longest day was probably a 12 hour day or something. But lately I've been falling asleep to memorizing and, and running every single move of my project that I'm doing out here at the Red. And it's far less moves because it's only an 85 foot route, but there is a, there is like a high level of joy. Like I'm almost excited for my head to hit the pillow. Cause I'm just like, I want to run that sequence again, you know? And I don't know if I'm even running it right. I might be reinforcing bad beta, but there is like an excitement level of doing that. There is. So let's talk about then taking you from those big wall days, big objectives, personal goals to now into coaching. As you said, you started with youth, you moved into adults, now all ages, all ability levels. If you were to try to sum up or define what makes you special in the coaching space or, or when clients come to you, climbers come to you, are there any common threads of issues or goals that they have that they say, okay, Justin is going to be the guy to help me through this. I would say a lot of fear and anxiety. Mm. The other one is I see a theme of people's strengths dominating. Their strength is a strength, which creates it as a weakness. So they mm. lean on their strengths a lot and they don't rely on their technique or their headspace or their mental tenacity. So I tend to find individuals of that nature, but the biggest thing is I have an eye to find the source of what's causing the negative cycle for an individual. Usually I can oh. dig in and find the source thing. If you fix, if you address this situation, all the other pieces will fall into place a little bit better for the next stage of where you kind of get stuck again. And often people, it's common that people are like, oh, that's, it feels very much like a therapy session. <laughs> right. It really, I don't try to get people to cry, but I've had a number of people kind of fall apart on me and like, oh, what you're saying is so relevant to my life and other parts other than my climbing. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah. Well, that's beautiful. I mean, I, I think that we're, we're, we're smiling because, you know, I, sometimes people come in and they just say, oh, I want to be able to boulder V8. And all of a sudden, you know, now they're reexamining every part of their life. And, and there's there's some humor there. But also climbing does, I think, serve to, to be a great metaphor for life. Yes. And climbers, while, you know, a, a subset of us are just out there, you know, kind of faffing around wanting to want to have fun. There's there's I feel like a maybe a larger subset that are really dedicated and really focused and really driven to improve as climbers. And typically those are going to be the ones that seek out coaches and and read the books and, and this kind of thing. And that personality trait doesn't always stop at climbing. And usually it's going to be it's going to apply to our lives. We're going to be driven and focused in school or at work or in our relationships. So if you're unraveling something, uh, uh, you know, that's happening in the climber's life, you might be unraveling something that's happening in their own life. And I think that could be really rewarding. Um, I, I'm, I'm sure you've had some of those experiences. Yeah. What you're kind of relaying there is you, I do tend to, I think any coach attracts an individual that is driven. 
but that drive, how they process and think, I think there's two common themes. There's the engineer who thinks logically and wants to understand the building blocks and how things piece together and the logical steps. And then there's the artistic or the intuitive athletes that just instinctually do many things correctly and struggle with being connected to the thought process Hmm. of climbing. And that's often where a lot of my coaches coaching is based around is kind of furthering, developing the, the thought process, the thinking, because people get lost in their head. And how do you go from where do you think, where do you not think, how do you think, like all those things. So I often find myself working with individuals on both spectrums, the engineer trying to get them to think less or think only in a manner that makes sense as an athlete, because you shouldn't be fully problem solving on the wall. You like, it's not the best place. Uh, and then the art, the artist or the more creative individual or intuitive individual, getting them to actually think and be able to recall what they actually did. Right. That's the other piece is like part of my evaluation process is exploring like how much awareness does this individual have of what just occurred? Right. Yeah. So th- this is interesting. And I, I would think that there's a personality type out there who probably knows what they are. Oh, I'm the engineer. Oh, I'm, I'm the artist. And then there may be some in the middle who, who aren't quite sure, who maybe have ch- traits of both. Uh, I'm actually not quite sure if I were to try to choose now, just like based on what we've talked about for five minutes, I don't know if I would be able to categorize myself. So I'm curious when a climber comes to you and it's your first day with them or your first handful of sessions, what, what does that look like? So usually an individual is very anxious and nervous mm-hmm. about climbing in front of me. So I really do sincerely want to see them climb well. So I try to get them on stuff that's very familiar or way below their ability. And I'm going to ask them, hey, I just want you to move the way you can move or des- wish to move. And so I mm-hmm. s- start to discover their values. Then when we start getting on harder things, they start A, do they care? Do they plan ahead before they give an effort? So do they preview? Do they rehearse the moves if it's familiar? And then when they walk to the base, what is their body language? Hmm. Most often an individual walks up and they're, they're projecting their concerns onto the boulder problem or the roof last minute doubts. Like they're projecting like, Oh, what about this? Oh, don't forget about this. Like all these what if scenarios. Right. But the reality is I, I'm like, okay, that's an over planner. Then there's the other individual who's like, they don't even look at, they tie in their full conversation. They're tying in or they're getting ready. They're chalking up and they're having a conversation for the first couple moves. Right. And that kind of leads me to the type of individual that they are. Uh And so if they are obsessing in a very productive way, I would say, if they're doing all that prep work, but there isn't, it's not focused and really intentional. It's kind of a, a disguise of I'm preparing often, I think. And so I try to calm that down. And then the other individual who's chatty, I just, they get to the second bolt, they're a train wreck. I just take and I lower and say, let's restart. And so I kind of teach a process where when you're at on the ground previewing, that is when you think about things in the future and past. What am I going to do or what did occur? Okay. And then once you're kind of tied in or about ready to chalk up, you need to transform into the present state. And the present state to me is being well connected with your three climbing senses, eyes, ears, touch, and feel. So I want the person to 
hear their breath, or I referred often to it as your engine. You hear it, you feel it come out of your lips. You soften the face, you diffuse your eyes, you're not zeroed in yet. And you feel your, your presence in your body. And I always love, like, when I get into that space, I get this shit-eating grin of I found it. <laughs> and that's when I know I'm ready to go. It's like I'm ready to go. I, I've done my prep work. I know I can rely on my skills or I have, might have moments on the climb where I need to queue up. Oh, don't forget. But I've done all that prep work on the ground and I'm not coming to the base of the route with all this confusion and chaos. There's a mm -hmm. calmness and a preparation for battle. Yeah, that's that, that kind of brief centering that you do there and especially the deep breaths, but like kind of that loose focus you're talking about trying to put the spinning mind behind all of that. I'm, I'm guessing. And as I've tried to implement some of this on, on some of the routes that I've climbed is to try to simultaneously bring a little bit of ease, maybe a little bit of a mitigation of fears or anxieties, whether that's fear of falling or send pressure, fear of failure, th these kinds of things that can well up before you like pull the first moves. But also it sounds like there's maybe an aspect of it that helps to to maybe hasten or, or invite an easier entry into a flow state, right? Because you're not overanalyzing all the moves in, in that. And so, I'm, yeah, I'm curious where you find that balance because I think on a technical climb, whether it's a six move boulder or a really tough crux sequence on a sport route or something like that, there is a certain level of precision and, and execution that's needed. And so where is that balance between letting go of the fears and the anxieties and maybe the over analytics, but also not getting to the point where you're talking about where the person walks up and they're just chit chatting and they're talking about going grocery shopping or whatever until the second bolt. Yeah. So I think every individual needs different things. Mm -hmm. So some individuals, I would agree, need a distraction. And that can be good right before they go. I am not that individual. So I have a very clear thing. So if we're tying in, uh, if it's a new partner, I do have real concerns. Not that I don't trust them, but they don't know me. And so often I actually have because what you're kind of referring to in your question, what I heard was, how do you calm yourself and actually find that present state right before through, and I use a partner. Hmm. My partner is an asset. I don't like to have deep conversation. I like to express my goals, my desires, and also, I think it's really important to express how I actually feel. So what I have learned is I need my belayer. When I look nervous, I need them to like, I'm with you. I've got you. I'm paying right. attention. I got you close. Commanding tone, but very brief and on point for what my hesitation. So they need to know me a little bit. When I'm climbing well, and I'm kind of strutting on the wall and I'm like feeling good about myself. I also like to hear my partner say, nice, good. You're looking good. Yeah. I'm with you. Beautiful. Like these positive aff affirmations. Yeah, but yeah. when on the flip side, that builds that trust in that relationship that I, my mind isn't going down to the belayer, but also they're paying close attention to my subtle body language. Like I might have my hips twisted and pulled up and then I look at the next move. I'm like, oh my God, I'm tired. It's so far. And I, 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 my hips and my, I bend down at my waist and my, my pelvis kind of turns and they're like, oh no, come on, you got this. And they demand me to try. I appreciate that. So then that changes my body language. And then I, and I try and I dig. Yeah. So but having that reliable blair that knows how to give you the things that you need and demand excellence out of you 
And like, I like my partner to, I don't like too much kindness. I personally like, come on, don't suck. Right. Like, <laughs> get on my case, get on my ass. Like, don't disappoint me again. Yeah. You always just go up there and say, take when it gets hard. Like, take a real fall. Yeah. Like, I expect that. Yeah, I love I love that this is where the conversation is going for for a few minutes here because I find that for myself and and I can notice it in, in you know some of the people that I go out climbing with I think that there's there's a hidden superpower here in having that like mind meld with your belayer. Let's say it, it, we're talking about sport climbing right now specifically, but if you're at the boulders with a group as well and somebody's spotting you and this kind of thing, having trust is important to help eliminate some fear. But also, I think we can all relate to whether it was just a gym session or on the moon board or, or out of the blocks or whatever, when there's that group psych and everybody's pumping each other up, you, you can just find a new gear. If you're on a real level with the group that you're with or with your belayer, and I find myself probably not communicating enough to my belayer, especially if it's a new belayer. Let's say you go out with a group and like, I've got my normal, like one or two people that catch me and they know what I like. They know that I like, it's similar to you, maybe a little softer. Like, I don't know if I like the, you know, don't suck as much, but like I respond very well to people, to my belayers, giving me that positive affirmation. Mm -hmm. Oh, you cruised that. You're looking strong. Great rest. Oh yeah. You know, like you're ready tight, tight, you know, like just, I like that kind of positive narration, if you will. But then I climb with some guys, one guy in particular who likes it silent. Like he just doesn't, he prefers it. And I'm always biting my tongue because I'm like really effusive and I'm always wanting to be like, you got this, you got this. And you know, but, but I know now that he doesn't like it. I think it gets in his head. He doesn't want the narration. He wants real silence. He doesn't want to hear people talking about where we're going to get a slice of pizza later or anything like that, you know? And so there's a long-winded way of saying that everyone's individual, right? But I think what I, an area where I could do better and maybe some who are listening could do better is finding ways to identify what we need and respond to and then finding ways to communicate that to, to the people that we're out with, right? Because knowing what you need and having somebody help you and support you in that are, are two different things. You, you have to be able to communicate it. Yeah, that comes back to the reflection process and realizing that there is a partnership, even with bouldering. And that spot or the the belay. So with that quiet individuals, yes, there are individuals that love it really quiet. But as a belayer, you start seeing a dialogue. And you in reflection, you can be like, are you sure you really want me to be 100% quiet? Like, I'm not looking to have a conversation. But do you want me to encourage you and just kind of somehow be there for you? And some people do like it silent. But I think most people like to hear that they're not alone mm -hmm. up there and that they are. Because I also believe as an athlete, as the climber, you're putting on a performance. A good performance is a mix of good and bad because that creates drama. It's boring to watch perfection because you're like, oh, they're going to hike it. I love that you make some mistakes, you clean it up, you do some brilliant things, and your belayer is genuinely enthralled with the performance that's going on. So I think that's, it's building that trust that it's like, don't tell me to go right, left, don't like, I think that's what most people really struggle with. They get like, they get their R's and L's mixed up. They're, they get confused with which hold are you referring to because I'm looking at this, but it doesn't make sense with what you're saying. Right. And so they don't want that beta sprayed at them, but often they do want some kind of encouragement or being known that they're there. Yeah. And that's, I like and I think it's, it also comes down to an authentic tone. If someone says it in a monotone, like they're disengaged. I don't think it's authentic and it doesn't really connect. But if you are passionately like in it and it's like you're excited for the catch, possible catch or just the great show. I mean, I think it's awesome. 
I love it too. And, and I agree that, that, that authentic engagement is, is critical. It's like, if you're on a rest and all of a sudden your belayer calls up and it's like, you got this, like you're like pulling into a crux, like there's, there's a dissonance it's there. Dissonant. Like it needs, <laughs> it needs to be matched with where you're at. You need to know that, that they're following you and they're, and they're on this with you. So we've got different personality types that we talked about. Mm-hmm. And, and you mentioned kind of stepping up to the climb, you can usually see when a client, what a client might need if you're doing like a first day out with them based on how they step up and approach a climb. What else are you looking at on that first day or those first, you know, early days through conversation or through just the, the climbing itself where you're assessing where they're at and what their needs may be? And then maybe we can dovetail into what some common cases are that you see in, in climbers that you work with. Yeah, so I would say I have a very systematic approach. I'm looking for five strengths, two weaknesses. Okay. An individual strengths doesn't mean that they don't need to ne- necessarily further enhance it. But I do identify the strengths that are the skills that boost their levels of confidence. And I used that word earlier in our conversation, a strut. Mm -hmm. So often people will have kind of a strut or a flare with how they move their legs or how they precisely place their toes or how they disengage and shake. Or some people get really obsessed with body positions and they're really expressive. Like there's all these different ways that someone can exude confidence. And I try to identify that because that is... When trouble arises, you want to lean into your strengths so you can feel confident because I believe we have two batteries. We have a physical battery and a mental battery or emotional battery. The physical battery, I think most people kind of get. The emotional battery, people that are have really good focus tend to lean in it too long and they drain the quality of their focus and their intensity. So I first identify their strengths. Then I start exploring, once we get to the harder climbs, what's limiting their growth or their potential to actually succeed. And often it tends to, the strengths for most people that early on that I work with them tend to be more technical. And then the weaknesses for tend to be more mental. Interesting. Yeah, because often they don't, really have a framework for their mental Hmm. other than, yeah, they just don't have really much of a framework other than they don't want to be fearful. Yeah. It's, it's harder to self-diagnose or self-coach some of those more esoteric ethereal concepts, the, the mental and the emotional. It's maybe more common for, for me to be able to say, well, I'm having a really hard time recovering on rests. Like that's something I can immediately see. It's, it's definitely a little bit harder to to self-assess and say, oh, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm clamming up on this move up here because I'm four feet above my bolt. I might just say, oh, my fingers have lost their power, right? You know, it, we tend to want to come back to like a technical reason. Yeah, you're hitting on something where people love to blame or lean into their physical weaknesses hmm. because it's very easy to systematically check the boxes to improve them. Right. Adding five more pounds on your hangboard is it's a logical progression. Like I can hang five more pounds, but am I applying five more pounds onto my feet? I don't know. We don't really have the technology yet to assess that clearly. Sure. The other thing that I often see that you're kind of leaning into is when we get physically tired that distracts us and we pay attention more to the upstairs, what our hands are doing, where our hands are going. And we disengage and pay less attention to what the children are doing downstairs or not doing with the footwork and stuff or staying engaged with the pulling, pushing with the legs or the toes, like your knees and your toes. And there's a disconnect there. And often when I'm as a coach, there's a moment where something went wrong didn't, they didn't fall, but they didn't go as planned down low. That threw them off their game. And that is the moment, actually, that I'm very curious if they can kind of recall. 
And it, if they actually can identify, if you knew that that occurred, why didn't you correct course? Why didn't you slightly acknowledge it and address it and deal with it? But most people, they kind of sweep it under the rug and pretend it didn't really happen. Like, oh yeah, I went here, but then I, I started drifting over here, but then I went over there. And it's like, that's a clear mistake. It's not a huge mistake. You didn't fall from it, but you lost your focus. You lost your, it was a mistake that kind of raised its head, dirty head. Right, so. right. And so you're, you're, when you're coaching somebody in this manner, you're not noting it in the moment you're asking them to recall it later. Yeah. Like, so they fall often in a coaching scenario. I don't yell up. I lower them to the ground and I go, okay, so what happened up there? Hmm. So what are the facts? A, at the moment you fell, but B, where did things start going wrong? Mm -hmm. And then I start asking, well, what do you need? Maybe where you fell, what do you need to make that successful? And then the last question is, how are you going to get it? So it's kind of three part. What happened? What do you need? And how are you going to get it? And often they, they don't have um, the framework to identify other than like, oh, my p fingers were just opening up. Right. And it's like, okay, I don't disagree with that. I'm not saying that that's not the case. But often there's some other things that kind of we can lean into and try to solve. So yeah. often what the most common thing I see is like someone is very expressive and using a lot of body language down low. They start getting pumped and they become very frontal because they want to fall in a forward frontal stance because it's more controlled. They don't like to be all twisted and using a lot of expression in their body language and fall in that manner because they feel like it's going to be very dangerous. So they start to square up and then it becomes a very strong pull. Right. And it's just trying to acknowledge that and get them to like, okay, this is where that occurred. This is the behavior. This is the programming that we have. And how do we address that? Yeah, that's really cool. Just speaking specifically to that last point there. We've got a big theme here that I love, but just just that like kind of practically speaking, Justin, I, I haven't heard it explained that way, but it makes a ton of sense. You'll often hear people talk about, oh, are you climbing too squared up or too neutral? Are you twisty? Are you using your hips? Are you getting close? Especially on steep climbs and, and you know, climbs, a lot of the climbs that I focus on he, out here at the Red, for example. But th this could apply to the moon board or anything else. And the way that you just described it essentially is that people start to climb pr preparing for a fall or they've got the fall in the mind. So they're, they're changing a climbing style. They know maybe there's a more efficient way to do it, but they're intentionally choosing the less efficient way, which of course then expedites the, the inevitable in, in a sense with the fall so that they can fall more square. So it's a fear of falling maybe in that scenario or, or just a, you're, you're I thinking wouldn't about always fall rather than it as a, I wouldn't necessarily say it's always a fear of falling. Uh -huh. I would say equally, it's a fear failure. Mm -hmm. Like they're scared to actually try. Got it. Yeah. And fall doing the right thing rather than most often people want to just get a new high point. And so if they can reach their hand further up, it's easy to justify I made a new high point. Uh, yeah. But they might have not... It, they didn't want to fall, maybe getting the right foot up. If they wanted to get like, it's like, oh, I can't, like I might fall getting the right foot up, but there's no glory in getting the right foot up. So they just extend and then they, they dead end themselves. Right. They also, we tend to get very frontal because the air pressure in their body becomes too high or tight. And so we, we can feel, feel the correct orientation when we our air pressure in our body the tension in our body decreases so okay. when we have lower air pressure we can feel where we want our body and when our air pressure is tight we have to logically tell our body where to go mm. air pressure meaning like we're clenched we're 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 just holding a lot of tension yep got it and like or even 
there's intentional tension, but often I would say for most climbers, it's unintentional tension, which is when we think we naturally hold our breath. Yeah. When we think we don't breathe as an athlete. So I often try to tell coach people and say, okay, one of our first lessons is we're going to learn how to think and breathe at the same time. Well, and, and how do so, we do that? <laughs> Cause you're totally yeah. right. We always hold our breath, mm -hmm. whether, whether we're, whether we're trying something hard or we're just super focused, like we're trying no. to thread a, a thread through a needle or something like that. We, yeah, we tend to hold our breath. So how does one work on thinking and breathing at the same time? Well, first of all, at the base, if we're sport climbing again, at the base of the ground, we find that center, but part of the center is the breath. We hear and feel a base, what I call a baseline breath. That is as low and relaxed as I can get. Mm -hmm. I climb up, every relatively good hold, I show appreciation and I express a breath. Now with that subtle, soft breath, nothing impressive actually ever gets done in a relaxed state. Okay. We never perform our best or try our hardest in that restate state, but that encourages life. Like we can stay and we can be supple. We can be fluid. We can feel confident. So we, sh we start hearing our breath. When we look at a hold, we, we look we identify, we see it. And then before we do it, when we're staring at it, we need to learn how to breathe and show appreciation that that is what I want next. Hmm. And so often the breath is a sign of appreciation of, yep, just like when it gets harder and you look at it, but you are expressing your breath. So you're connected to your engine. Right. Okay. So the thinking part often is very correlated to our eye connection. And we want to see one of our climbing senses and hear and feel those other sensations to stay in the moment. Mm -hmm. And if you can really keep the purr of the engine purring or revving or and just hear you shift through those gears of intensity through your breath it's beautiful and you don't want to like over breathe because i've seen that when people try to do that but you want to like really engage your breath at the beginning so we learn how to do it on easy climbs and then we progress up and then we can get to a project level and then I think a true sign of mastery is on the on-site. Can you do it during an unknown? This episode is supported by Maxim Ropes. And if you take as many whips as I do, you want to be sure that your rope is amazing. And I'm telling you guys, my airliner is hands down the nicest rope that I have ever tied into. The 9.1 millimeter Maxim airliner is an ultra light and skinny lead line, but that featherweight doesn't sacrifice an ounce of performance, y'all. It is frequently referred to as the indestructible airliner due to its longevity, which is awesome for a few reasons. First, peace of mind. So, I mean, real talk here, I struggle with fear of falling, and I just want full confidence that my rope has got me, and the airliner, which is triple certified, goes above and beyond in that department. I love it. And then second, I don't want to have to shell out for a new rope every season. They're expensive, and Maxim goes the distance here, which also means that it has a smaller impact on our environment, which is really cool. And then lastly, the airliner is so light, it makes the approach a breeze. It feeds through my gear incredibly smoothly, so I can save all of that energy to flail around on my project. Not Maxim's fault, but I'm working on it. So if you're looking for a super lightweight, ultra thin, and extremely durable cord, you have found it. Check it out at your local gear shop or online. And you can see all of the ropes that Maxim has to offer by hitting that link in your show notes there or popping over to thestruggleclimbingshow.com slash Maxim. You posted a video fairly recently. I don't know if it was an onsite or a flash, but it was, you were, you were showing the, the balance or the disparity between the looking and the moving yes. as, as you were, I think, trying to navigate this route for the, for, for the first time. And, and I'd love for you to, I'll, I'll link to the video. So people see you did a really good job because you like labeled and timed actually how much looking you were doing and how much actual movement you were doing on the route. 
and obviously there was breathing and there was listening and feeling and, and, and all of that happening. This was focusing on the visual sense uh, for the most part, I think. And was that an onsite or a flash that you were doing? I'd love to dive into that for a second. It's likely a repeat, but it was probably in the early 90s late nineties that I did it last time. Retro so, flash, right? Yeah, I would call it a red old man flash, but like for that, that was on limestone, kind of a, a dolomite style limestone. So it required a lot of detailed looking mm -hmm. and seeing the subtleties. I also try to coach athletes to when you're looking to not drift because often people, when they're looking, they'll, their hand, will track where their eyes are going. Interesting. And so they let go and they're like looking and their hand will come off. And when you release that hand off that other hole, your air pressure, your tension in your body increases automatically. So if you can stay connected, but call it like soften your eyes, see the big picture and minimize the amount of head movement. Because when our, we have blinders on, we're very focused. So we have to, rapidly move our head, but it all becomes a blur. Mm -hmm. And so what I was trying to express is the importance to diffuse, see the big picture, identify what you want, zero in, and then move. And there's very little noise in your body when you're looking. Right. Yeah. And that's, that's in my experience, at least, easy to do when I'm feeling fresh and got energy or I'm on a really good stance and I'm like, cool, let me just relax here and just, you know, gaze around. But as soon as the pump clock is building or I'm oh. five feet above a bolt or, you know, I'm cruxing out on some small holds and, and especially if it's an onsite, you know, and I know I need to go somewhere, but I, that's where that kind of that flailing that, that, that comes. Yeah. That searching yeah. comes from. And so yeah, how do you how do you bridge that gap or how do you work with clients that that can do it on, you know, in that in that A scenario like I was talking about, but but then struggle when the stakes are ratcheted up? Uh progressions. So start off where you can succeed, start then build to a point where you can almost do it perfectly, but you're missing a few points, and mm -hmm. then kind of set yourself up for train wreck scenarios. <laughs> okay. And it's more getting the athlete, the climber to build awareness of that frantic behavior with the eyes and how unproductive it really is. Uh, and often like I, I, there's a source of it. A, it could be the air pressure's too high and they're not actually breathing. It could actually be, they don't have a logical plan of what to do and they're scared of failure or they just don't know, like they can't slow their mind down to find the next single step rather than like they just get busy. What if this, what if that, like they're all these what if scenarios mm -hmm. and they get really rapid. So how do I coach it? How do I train it? Repetition. Repetition is the only way. And then as a coach building awareness. So how'd that go? So do you remember that moment where you might have lost it? Can you tell me where that was? Great. When you didn't lose it, what were you doing really well? And they can name what they were doing well mm -hmm. and then how it turned ugly. So get them to discover the change. And then what caused you to go down that ugly road? And is there maybe a behavior or an action or a method to regain your composure? Yeah. And like it's just that. practice and repetition. Like I'm a huge fan of just repeating the climb and experiencing what we want and then dropping it down to an easy onsite and see if they can get it to occur on an easy onsite. And it's really not about perfection. Because we all lose our shit once in a while where we just start frantically looking. But do we have the awareness to like, oh, that's not helpful and back off. And usually it's usually like, oh, I've been holding my breath. Because if you hold your breath, you're going to panic. And how do we express panic? Through darting eyes. So 
Yeah. Or in some individuals, their focus is they've been focused for too long and they don't actually pause on the route is another one. So they actually become vulnerable mentally because they've been focused for too long and they haven't spaced out and given their brain, their mind, and just kind of relaxed it. Oh, interesting. So if we're talking about a longer climb, I'm assuming here, if it's, if it's a short boulder problem, yeah, uh, it's maybe not. Different experience. Yeah, different experience, but, but staying on theme with, with like a sport route, for example, you're looking for opportunities with how the route breaks up where you can actually intentionally zone out, kind of soften everything and just like let the mind wander. I'd love to learn a little bit more about about what that looks like for, for you and some of your clients. So for me, we don't want our mind to wander. Okay. Because I do see that like they people don't know where to look. Right. So someone that's not comfortable resting or pausing, and I like to use the word pause often because rest often refers to an individual physically recovering. But if we pause, we're actually recovering mentally. And we can do that very short and briefly. Yeah. So when someone mentally pauses, I want them to express the breath, but their eyes, their pupils need to actually fixate onto something meaningless. Okay. And so if I'm on one hand up and I drop and I look down, sometimes it's onto the ground and I find some single point to stare at, to focus on. And I reconnect to my senses and I just space out. I really try to become present and just and feel my body. And then that allows me to sharpen my focus because there's a moment of contrast where I'm really soft and supple. And then I love that bringing back, and especially if it's hard again, changing the facial expression, the body language of command, if that's necessary, or fluid, if it's another section of flow and playfulness of kind of expressing that. Yeah. But that pause is really about doing nothing other than reconnecting with your climbing senses. Yeah, cool. I like that. I think that while we're physically recovering, having that that mental pause and not just staring down the next crux hold, you know, the whole time uh, can, can help to bring a little bit of that freshness back in, into the mind. And then when it comes time to turn it on and you got to you got to just fully engage, then you're taking a minute to connect with your your breath or your body or your eyes or all of that in in a different way, right? When we're coming out of that pause. Yeah, now you're kind of talking about, I have to pre-try before I can actually try. Okay. So about that. my pre-try or my pre-effort is like, I need to find comfort in actually trying before it's where I actually, actually think I have to really try. Because the first time I try, my timing, my I feel slightly vulnerable because I'm expressing desire to actually do well. Sure. And that's scary sometimes. And like, and just kind of like feeling the pop, the rhythm, the sync of everything. And usually it's slightly misfired. But once I pre-fire once or twice and then maybe i have a moment of decompression again and then i hit the key moment my timing and my authenticity for just executing is on tends to be more on point yeah yeah cool that's and it allows me to actually get the belayer because that's another thing i like i stress out like is the blair aware right so when I do the pre-war cries a little bit, like try, I'm curious if my belayer actually responds. And if they do, I'm like, cool, they got my back. They see the drama that's occurring and they're going to give me the belay that I am looking for. Yeah. Cool, man. I like that. It's, it, it's, it may take a little bit more physical energy, but it sounds like it's, it's like priming the pump so that you can be at 100%. It's like doing some heavy hangs before doing a moonboard session or something like that. If you're looking at it just purely physically, you're, yeah. you're, you're trying to get everything going. If you're coming out of a, a four minute jug rest where you were softening your focus and, and trying to really pause and recover, 
it's giving you that opportunity to rev the engine before you have to go and, and punch through that that next sequence. Hopefully so as a coach, out. you're, you're kind of hitting on something else that I love to do is on the training boards, I'll take an athlete and get them on a rowing machine. Hmm. And the rowing machine, your knees, and there's a rhythm to your knees and elbows. And when we climb, there's a relationship between our knees and elbows to create movement momentum in right. our body and trying hard. And if the knees and elbows aren't in sync, that's where a gyration in our body kind of occurs. That noise, extra noise. So by going to the rowing machine, I love to, and there's a roar, like our rowing machine has a fan on it. Right. And it revs like a pet, like, and you're just, you start off and I love to do sets of like lower intensity and then max intensity, low intensity. And like you cycle through it and I'll take an athlete, do that for a moment. They rest briefly. And then we get on to their project. And they are always surprised that they can easily tap into a new, higher level of desire and execution. Even though they're physically tired. Yeah. They have like primed the pump, as you were saying, to actually try hard passionately. Is the key to sending harder just bringing a rowing machine out to the crag, do you think? Yes. Yes. That's what we need. Every crag. Yeah. Just what we need. Yes. I love this actually, because there's a rowing machine at, at my gym. I'm going to do a yeah. session tomorrow. And so, no, for the gym, for the gym. Yes. But like, you know, there, there's sometimes I'll hit like the rower or something like that, just to kind of warm up the body. But I like this sense of that rhythm and like going hard, like you're saying, and like feeling the engine go both of the rower and in our lungs and then hopping on because it's not like we're going to be hugely fatigued we're not doing you know massive amounts of works on the finger flexors or anything like that it's just it's just it's the big muscle groups right yeah like, it is your back and shoulders it's your legs like and so those muscles tend to recover quicker they, they're not taxing your fingers and then if we're talking on a training board i mean we're talking seven moves max yeah 10 seconds <laughs> something like that yeah that's that's a great we've been talking about a lot of like you know fairly nebulous topics here but like just in terms of a practical tip to help us try to get into that body and and into those senses like you're talking about to use a tool like that i'm, I'm going to try that the next time i get to the gym is, is there an equivalent that we can do if we're out bouldering or if we're out on a sport route what what do you like to do before you pull on that tries to get your body and your mind into that state like warming up yeah if there's like is it like a, the last thing you do on a warm-up or or do you have a routine like yeah how, how are you how are you fully primed not coming out of that rest like we're talking about because you'll have climbed into that but like before you pull on especially if there's a low crux on a sport route or if it's a boulder i would say the low crux is the hardest for me mm -hmm because I have a hard time personally trying hard. This isn't the case for everybody. Sure. But when the crux is down low and it's hard, I have to kind of pre-rev on the ground. And yeah. then I find a calmness. So I'll just, and I'll like get kind of intense and, and then I kind of calm myself for a moment and then I try, but the key piece for me is my skin. Like usually if you're trying hard, the holds are small, right? I need endorphins in my skin. So I don't feel the pain. Uh -huh. So I'll actually take my fingers and beat them on the, the rock. So it triggers the, like a, an endorphin into your fingertips where it kind of re numbs the pain. Right. So I kind of pre-do it. So I just sort of, and then, and then it usually takes a few tries for me. Yeah. So part of my warm up process is actually trying hard. Most people think of warming up is just to prevent injury. For me, the warm up process, if I am genuinely trying to perform well, I do need to try hard. 
I love that. I mean, I think that it's it's important mentally and physically to to get into that place a little bit before hopping onto the thing. Now, if it's a boulder and you can fire it a handful of times, then you can be trying hard on on the thing. But if no. it's a, a sport route, we got to find some other creative ways to do that. I'm curious. We we have just a little bit of time left here, and we got we're gonna have to do another one of these because I think we've touched on ten things in this conversation that I could do an entire hour on, but. As you're, you know, we've been talking about working with new clients as you've been taking in new clients for, for those that you've worked with for a long time that you've had for many seasons, many years, maybe. And regardless of their climbing ability, they could be an elite climber or, or a weekend warrior and, you know, somebody in the, in the beginning stages of their career. But are there themes that you start to work through? after you've worked with them for a little while what are those those barriers that that start to pop up after kind of the low-hanging fruit has been plucked so a hopefully by then they've identified they know when they're climbing well okay what i do as a coach is i don't i'm not cruel but i do try to create scenarios where they lose their mojo because that's what happens when we climb and when we care. There is a moment often that we lose our confidence and our mojo. And then the game becomes with that athlete. Can you reestablish it? Mm -hmm. Do you know how? A, can you identify early enough so you don't dig yourself into a deep hole? Sure. And then B, do you know how to reestablish it? And someone that is newer can, um, might be able to identify it, but they actually have to back off on the climbing ability and actually reestablish climbing well and reconnect. Mm -hmm. But a higher level athlete will just acknowledge that and they'll be able to self-evaluate really quickly, like what their tendons, we all have tendencies. And they might know like, oh, I'm falling into this trap again. And they know how, they've already practiced how to recorrect course and they can recorrect course right then and there. Yeah, cool. That's cool. I, I do notice that when I watch Jonathan Segrist, for example, or something like that, you know, like he's so in touch with, with how he performs his movement. And when something doesn't go as planned, he's still able to, I think, very quickly assess, recover, adjust, and then move on where I'm, I'm not. Typically, I, I really get in my head. Like if, if I'm climbing near my limit and a move or a sequence doesn't go as planned, if this is a red point, not like an onsite or something where you know like things are going to go sideways, but it's like on my project right now, that'll throw me off. I'll almost always kind of just be like, well, I'm going to take here and I'll brush and we'll, we'll give it another go. It's it's hard for me to kind of get bumped out of that that script that I think I've set for myself on on a really hard red point. And I'm not sure, you know, from your perspective, if that's if when we're trying to climb the hardest thing ever, everything does need to go perfect, or if if that's um, asking too much. If maybe it's it's more if it's a healthier way to say, well, no, there needs to be margin in there where things can go wrong, and you can still adjust and evolve and bounce back from it. I think perfection is silly to aim for. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's, it's very rare. And if it is happening, it's probably not on something that is at your actual limit. I think what you're naming or suggesting is, A, can you identify when things are going wrong? Do you know how to reestablish it? But having the confidence knowing that it doesn't have to actually go 100% as planned. Most people call it on the ground when you preview or sequence what you're going to do. And I like to refer to it as rehearsal because you are putting on a show, a performance. And so you're going to rehearse that performance. Part of a good rehearsal is anticipating the things that might go wrong so knowing and understanding yourself, how you might go astray as mm -hmm. planned, but rehearsing, how are you going to get back on course? So you have a strategy on how to bounce back. 
and knowing. So our earlier conversation about climbing on the big stone, El Cap, you kind of have to learn how to bounce back. Things don't have to go 100% perfect. And if you believe that it does, it causes more stress and strain and you're more likely to fumble and drop the ball. So yeah. knowing that you can make mistakes, because I also believe in our mistakes, our flaws, our imperfections make us awesome. So a great performance is you screw up, but you bounce back from that is a phenomenal performance. It's way better than perfect. Perfect, like I said earlier, was boring. <laughs> I love that. I love the drama and the the analogy to it, it being this performance, this show, because yeah, it does give you that opportunity to embrace the drama and the conflict and the ups and the downs. And also just what you were just saying there um, about the rehearsing really resonated with me because oftentimes I'll visualize perfection, right? I'll stand at the bottom mm -hmm. and I'll say, okay, left hand here, right hand here, grab that three finger pocket, perfect. But to your point, A, it's highly unlikely that it's going to happen if it's a limited project that you're going to hit everything perfect and B, you need to be ready for when it doesn't. And so I do like thinking about, okay, well, I know I need to grab this three finger pocket this way, but what if I only get two fingers into it? Okay, yep. well, that's not perfect, but what can I do to recover there? And so actually thinking through some of those likely imperfect scenarios, if you will, could can then prepare you for that moment. It's just different than, I guess, what I've been doing and maybe what I've heard others talk about with regard to visualization, where you you visualize the perfection or you visualize the ideal. Visualize, but also when people sequence, they, they, uh, and someone that's slightly insecure in front of myself, watching them as a coach, they're not going to mimic the moves. And I really try to get them to mimic the actual moves and express what needs to happen. Sure. Because when we think, when we visualize, that's your brain taking in the information. When you're rehearsing and you are mimicking the moves and the actions, that is your body actually taking that in. Mm -hmm. And so if you're only mentally rehearsing in your head and not expressing it through your body, that means your brain is going to be dictating orders when you climb. And realistically, we want the conscious brain to go into the background because our body actually does the beautiful work on the wall. And the and the mind is in this background and just making sure everything's running well and it's assisting. But it's so, the brain loves to think it's so superior. And it's like, no, I'll tell you what to do. You're going to screw this up. First you do this, now you do this, then you do this. Right. And your body knows how to compensate. So if you hit that three finger pocket slightly wrong, Maybe you can still do the move, but you have to express and get more out of your toes because you don't have the hands quite right. Or maybe you're, whatever it is in that scenario, there's other ways we compensate that because climbers compensate differently all the time on cruxes. Right. Like your partner working the same climb might actually do it slightly different than you. And the reason why is they're compensating with their assets that they have. Oh man, this is such good stuff. Well, uh, this is perfectly timed because I'm uh, about to get back out on, onto the project after taking a little time off here. And so I'm going to try to implement some of this. I'm going to let you know how it goes. And I'd love to dive into any number of, of these topics again on, on another conversation. Justin, thank you so much for just you know bringing your experience, your perspective and, and letting this conversation go where it wanted to go, which was in some surprising areas, but I'm, I'm really hyped that it did. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me on. I enjoyed the conversation. So if people want to work with you, how can they get in touch? Uh, they can visit climbing-sensei.com for my website. Uh, I'm on Instagram under Justin Shong. Justin's with an E and Shong is S-J-O-N-G. That's great. Well, everybody can find you. I'll, I'll link to all that stuff here also in the show notes to make it easy on y'all. And, and where's, where's the sensei come from? Uh, years ago in California, there was 
this gentleman that just one day just kind of referred to me as like, man, you're just like a sensei. Like you're always like teaching. You're always giving these nuggets. And he just started, the Craig just started calling me the sensei. And that wraps up this coach conversation here with the very aptly monikered climbing sensei, Justin Zhang. Very, very thoughtful guy. I really enjoyed this one. You can check out all those links in your notes if you'd like to connect with Justin and work with him. You can also see the videos that I was referencing throughout our conversation here that he posts. Really cool, well-produced content over on his Instagram, which is at Justin Zhang. J-U-S-T-E-N-S-J-O-N-G. The links are right there in your notes. Hey, if you'd like to see the uncut video of this chat and score instant access to more than 40 hours of bonus content, including bonus episodes with the likes of Adam Andra, Hazel Finlay, Alex Honnold, Chris Sharma, Allison Vest, Tom Randall, and so many more amazing athletes and coaches, you can get it all for about the price of a beer each month. And I'm telling you, I could really go for a beer right now. So if you are in a position to buy me one, that would be so rad. There's also a free trial happening right now. So you know, if you want to date me a little bit before you buy me that beer, I get it. And I'm just really grateful for your support as I grind away down here in my basement podcast slash utility closet. You can swing on over to patreon.com slash the struggle climbing show to access that full library of bonus content. Or if you're an iPhone person, you can subscribe right there in your Apple podcast player. Huge thanks and appreciation to our show sponsors who have brought you this episode at zero cost. Check your show notes for those links and special discounts that are only available to you, the Struggle listener. And by the way, you can see all of the show's partners and special deals by popping over to the struggleclimbingshow.com slash deals. Did you know that The Struggle is carbon neutral in partnership with the Honnold Foundation? Well, you do now. They are doing such amazing work, you guys, to bring clean energy to communities around the world. You can get all inspired by their latest grant recipients over at honnoldfoundation.org. And toss them some love if you can. They are doing such impactful, amazing work. And lastly, The Struggle is a proud member of the Plug Tone Audio Collective, a diverse group of the best, most impactful podcasts in the outdoor industry. This show was produced and hosted by me, Ryan Devlin. All right, that clips the anchors on this episode. Thank you so, so much for tuning in. And if you liked it, and if this show in general just brings you some value and some joy, would you consider sharing it with your buddies, with your climb friends, your relationships, your gym crew, whatever, you know what I'm talking about. Just share it. The more who listen, the closer I will get to making this my full-time gig, which would just be so rad. Thank you. I love you. All right. I hope your training and climbing are going great, and I will see you next week.